Okay, this is a board education meeting for the Hyde Park Central School District, November 14th, 2019, here at Violet Avenue Elementary. Can I have a motion to go into executive session to discuss the employment of a particular person and the proposed lease adjustment of real property? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Okay, welcome to the Hyde Park Central School District's Board of Education meeting on Thursday, November 14th, here at Violet Avenue Elementary. Can everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, we have one agenda modification. Uh, item 11.3 will be removing uh, policy 1222 from uh, cons first consideration. Can I have a motion to amend the Don't agenda? Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Motion carries. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda as adopted? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. So upcoming events. Um, tomorrow at FDR High School, we'll have the fall drama Sense and Sensibility at 7 p.m. Followed up by on Saturday for a matinee performance at 2 p.m. Uh, Wednesday, November 20th, the Hyde Park Education Foundation will be meeting at the district office. On Tuesday, December 3rd, Haviland Middle School's concert number one at 7 p.m., followed by Wednesday, December 4th, Haviland Middle School's concert number two at 7 p.m., and then again on Monday, December 9th, Haviland's Middle School concert number three, all of them at 7 p.m. Next Board of Ed meeting will be on December 12th, and that will be in Haviland Middle School in the library. Okay, on to Pride. Hi. So, this week for Pride, I'd like to highlight what's been going on in Violet Avenue since we're here. So first, Violet Avenue would like to thank the Hyde Park Rotary Club for continuing its tradition of donating dictionaries to the school's third grade students. Um, next, in part with the arts and education event that's happening throughout the elementary schools, author Isa Tripani came to the school and worked with the kindergarten and first grade students. She read one of her books, sang some songs, and talked with the children about the process of an author's life. Of course, our very own Mrs. DeMaio came along too and even played the ukulele. I, I'm a strong advocate for keeping the arts in education. I really think that it's crucial for complete development because it really enhances not only what you do academically, but socially and emotionally. So I really think that this is great to see throughout the elementary schools. Um, finally, the fifth grade students took a trip to New York City today to visit the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. This trip was a supplement to what the classes have been learning in their, element, er, in their ELA and social study classes about the immigrant and migrant experiences in the United States. Personally, I can still remember my fifth grade trip to New York City like, like it was yesterday, and I truly think that this is a great educational experience for the kids that hopefully they will too remember in years to come. Next, on to Haviland. In November, we focus a lot on giving back to others, and in, in the spirit of that, Haviland Middle School collected donations for the Hyde Park Food Pantry in the form of a can drive. They were extremely successful with the turnout, and the student government loaded many boxes onto the bus to be taken to the food pantry which was completely empty before they started, but filled up by the time they left. 
Something I want to point out is that even in the cold, while carrying these heavy boxes in and out, the kids in the photos were all smiling. And I think that just shows the importance that giving has in everyone's lives. Again, I can remember when I did this in middle school and how I was amazed to see that people could just come together and accomplish something so amazing. So I'm really happy to know that they're continuing this throughout the years as well. At FDR, something similar is happening throughout the month of November, a food drive challenge, and we'll donate all, the, all that we receive to the Claudio Cares Foundation. And actually, Stop and Shop donated 75 reusable bags, so that was pretty cool too. And then also, as mentioned, this Friday at 7 p.m. and Saturday at 2 p.m., the FDR fall drama, Sense and Sensibility, is coming out. <laughs> From 4 to 6.30 p.m. before, on Friday only, there will be a spaghetti dinner in the cafeteria with salad, bread, drinks, and even 24 raffle tickets. So that's included in your price. The pre-sale price is $15, and it's $20 at the door, but all proceeds will support the senior class. So make sure to come out and support your FDR music program and the FDR class of 2020. And also, the girls cross country team won the 2019 Mahal Championships, and Sarah Trainer actually made it to states. Um, this week, Sarah also committed to the University of North Carolina, where she will be continuing her academic and running career. So congratulations to Sarah and the cross country team. And in swim news, nine girls on the team made it to sectionals, including Colleen Biscop, Catherine Graham, Catherine Graham, Lauren Sanford, Mackenzie Hannon, Morgan Hannon, Emma Jarvis, Delaney Jarvis, Cass Cassie Jarvis, and Angela Anthony. Catherine actually took first place in the 100 breaststroke with 105.50 and will continue on to states. So congratulations to her and the entire team. And then I'd also like to quickly acknowledge the uh, career fair today. It was very successful. It's really great to show the opportunities to all the students that we have of all the job opportunities surrounding uh, Dutchess County and the Hudson Valley. So that was very good. <laughs> Anybody else have more pride? Um, I just wanted to say that I attended the community night at Havlin, and um, Carl was there working, doing a great job. <laughs> I think it was great to see the turnout from the parents. It was a very interesting night. Um, there's a lot on the website that shows um, the various displays and so forth that were available for parents. I thought it was a, a great night, and it was great to see all the parents out at that event. I'd also like to say that I've recently attended some um, cybersecurity trainings with our superintendent and with a number of the technology staff. This is a very hot topic across the country. And I'm very, very happy to see that Hyde Park has taken this very seriously and um, that they were in attendance in these events. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Uh, we have one formal piece of pride, and I'm going to invite Tom uh, Cunningham, our athletic director, to the podium. Um, Tom was uh, um, utilizing our, our rubric that we use um, for evaluations, and he was sparked by something about improving the opportunities to recognize students. So he proposed that um, for this school year, at the end of each student, we would have a special fall sportsmanship award. So we are very pleased, and I'm very pleased, that uh, Tom Cunningham is here tonight to do the first ever uh, sportsmanship award in the district that's not associated with end of the year. Um, so he thought long and hard about this. He he proposed it to the coaches, he got their buy-in, he got some suggestions from them. So lo and behold, here we are tonight for a very special occasion. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom. So thank you very much for initiating this uh, this worthwhile endeavor. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me here tonight. Uh, as you said, this was an uh, initiative that we started this fall with our with our varsity coaches. So I just want to kind of explain what, I, what we uh, set up here. For, um, for this award. So we sent out some criteria to the coaches. So we ask that you, uh, you select this particular athlete thinking about the following things. Abide by this particular person, abides by the rules of the game, tries to avoid arguments, share in the responsibilities of the team, always play fair, respect the other team's effort, offer encouragement to teammates, and accept the judgment calls of the game officials. Just a couple other things I sent to the coaches just about sportsmanship in general. 
Sportsmanship is poised and courage in the face of adversity. It's about respecting the opposition, gaining love of competition, and above all, understanding the value of trying your best while learning how to win and lose graciously. I thought another one that was important was promote, promoting participation in sportsmanship to develop good citizens through interscholastic activities, which provide equitable opportunities, positive recognition, and learning experiences to students while maximizing the achievements of educational goals. So thinking of that tonight, we're fortunate to have all of our award winners um, come here tonight to accept this certificate on behalf of their coaches and the athletic department. So when I call your name, I'd like you to come up. Uh, receive the award and just stand up here in front if yeah, that's so okay with you guys. Nice group photo. Okay. Our first um, is girls tennis. It's Elena Martinez. So Elena, please come up. Okay. Next is boys golf, Ian Rock. For cheerleading, we have Patrice Cranston. <laughs> Girl soccer, Lindsay Tiedman. Like Boy soccer, Jacob Casilla. Football, Liam Halligan. <laughs> Volleyball, Mary Blitz. <laughs> Boys Cross Country, Jack Birchwood. Girls Cross Country, Ali Klotz. And Girls Swimming, Natalie Colazo. Closer. And moving closer. closer. <laughs> 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 you want to get the whole group. You want to get the whole group. You want to get the whole group. Oh, I gotta get something. I, okay. I think that'll be posted, right? <laughs> Jay, you'll post that picture? Yes. Okay. So, so that picture will be posted. You guys could take it. I know some of you didn't get a chance. Yeah. Any more, pride? Sarah, ac uh, Rachel actually uh, covered it all. So thank you, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Excellent job. Yeah, no okay, on to superintendent's report. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to uh, do um, in addition to our formal reports is to ask the board to weigh in on a date for the uh, retreat workshop. And mm -hmm. um, we generally try to keep it on Thursdays, uh, board meeting nights, but not a board meeting. So we're looking at uh, January 3rd or February 6th. Um, you could certainly check now, but we'll get back to Jay. We don't need to make the decision tonight, but I just wanted to put it on your radar that um, in order to meet your goals successfully, you got to pick a date for this one. So, is that um, January 30th? January 30th or, or February 6th. So, um, Jay can send something out, but I'll uh, wanted to. Do it while we were all here together. Um, we can we can talk about that in a board discussion. Okay, good. <coughs> um, the next 
on the formal agenda is uh, time off for voting and the implications for Hyde Park. So this was an interesting one. The uh, New York State passed a law that permitted employees time off for voting and um, it was very interesting because they also simultaneously did uh, early voting so they expanded the amount of time that people had for voting <clears throat> but they also gave permission for people to take three hours off from work and so the implications that it has for Hyde Park uh, should the law not be changed is that we may mean, need to make some calendar decisions based on what happened this uh, past voting um, on, on election day. So on election day we had a staff development day so that meant no students but that meant all faculty and um, in order to plan those days we plan them mostly about a year in advance and there's a certain amount of planning and expense that goes in so if we're if the voting law stays in place <clears throat> and we're going and we experience what we experienced in November um, we're gonna have to look at the calendar differently so we had um, about a hundred and six employees um, about 96 of the teaching staff now students weren't in session um, take the three hours so <clears throat> when I say it has implications if we have school in session on one of the voting days we could possibly run into problems so we looked at the county the rest of the county did not experience what we experienced so we're just gonna have to take it one step at a time okay and we're also what looking at there's a big push in the state to make schools a choice whether or not they're voting polls and even if that was the case and polling wasn't done here in the school we wouldn't have enough teachers to hold school anyway right right yeah um, and you know the only other district in the county that experienced some was beacon with 20 people out but we were over a hundred so the rest were somewhere between zero and four so we definitely have to take a look at it okay any other comments okay on to 7.3 violet avenue elementary update from principal gonzalez I'm, I'm just going to interrupt for one minute. We have a lot of students and parents here, and sometimes people feel awkward if they're here and they've been invited and they got their certificates and they say, ah, what do we do now? So you were here for the pride and the recognition. While we would love to have people stay, we will pause for a minute because truly the students have homework. They need to get home. You know, it's, it's your decision, but you do not have to stay. Thank you and congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to stay. Uh, <laughs> They're so polite. How to clear a room in a hurry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just, oh, I just realized they were like, oh, oh they're just being so polite. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Hear them? Oh, I guess they were here for us, huh? <laughs> they were, yeah. This is how it all starts. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Uh. Anna, don't take it personally. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Don't take it personally, Dan. <laughs> 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 uh, mm -hmm. They should like spread out. I'm going to read the list, but I just. I, that's gonna leave, leave. Yeah, <laughs> now that's the next <laughs> issue. My best friend. Yeah, just, just give it a minute. Nobody from our district. It's something I said. <laughs> now we have plenty of chairs. It's just us. <laughs> it's just us. <laughs> I could have taken the time too. Right, right. I said to Tim, I said, did everybody leave at Marshall's Valley? He said, what are you talking about? Public Gipsy didn't even advertise it. I didn't. They were just like, yeah. Well, that's all right. I'm I didn't hear from Public Gipsy. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It's nice to have you at Violet Avenue again this year. Um, welcome to our an annual presentation. All 
right, there we are. Um, so our High Park Central School District um, vision and mission is right next to our Violet Avenue um, mission and motto. Um, so our mission is a diverse, caring community that's dedicated to excellence. And our motto um, is daring to be awesome. Um, and we, we definitely try to live by that each day. Um, who we are, just a little bit of a comparison. You'll notice that some of the categories on this chart are not filled in yet. That's because we don't have our annual report card published in public yet. Um, so I didn't have some of the uh, socioeconomic status data yet. Um, it isn't all in, but I filled in everything else that I had. Um, our current enrollment is slightly lower than last year, but um, up from the 2007-2018 school year. Um, so we are in the high 200s, close to 300 students. Um, you'll notice that we continue to be ethnically diverse in our building. Um, and that we are servicing more ENL English as a new language students in the district as well. Um, our low socioeconomic status students, the district-wide percentage was 29%. Um, and Violet Avenue, I anticipate, will remain around 70% of our students are, are qualifying to take advantage of the federal free and reduced lunch program. For our ELA data for this year, so you'll see our school in comparison to the district, in comparison to the state. Um, so our performance in comparison to the district was similar to the district results, um, with us being sl uh, slightly higher. We are the same um, in the fifth grade level and higher in third and fourth grade. Um, in percentages across, if you look across, still not as high as the state, and so our goal is to be higher than the state, and at least 5% higher by the end of the school year. That's our goal. Um, but we, that is our performance in comparison to the district and in comparison to the state. So I would love to see us much higher than the state because our kids are definitely capable of that. For math, again, it is our school compared to the district and compared to the state. Um, and again, we are above or very close to where the district performed. Um, so our school is comparable to the district percentages, still slightly lower. Um, we're higher and closer and catching up to the state a little faster in the area of math. Um, but again, I think we're definitely capable and our 5% goal applies to math for this school year as well. going a little too fast for me. Our fourth grade science exam scores, 89% of our kids, of our students, scored at a three or a four, so they were proficient or above proficiency in the area of science again this year. And we've consistently been, we were 89% last year, but we've consistently been in the 90s uh, across the last few years, so our kids do do very well in the area of science. Our opt-out numbers, we had very few opt-outs. I know you probably noticed this as well in Aviva's presentation earlier in the school year. Um, we had very few students. Um, so the chart that you see in front of you is actually the number of students. Um, we had no students opt out at the third grade level, only three students at the fourth grade level, and only six students at the fifth grade level, which was an overall percentage of opt-out of only 8%. Um, so we do enjoy a very low opt-out rate which is which is nice because we, we can see more of the abilities of all of our students so we do enjoy an overall low percentage of opt-out growth scores according to MAPS exams. Um, our ELA score was 15, which fell in the effective range. The math score was 17, um, which is also in the effective range. The overall building wide score, the average of the two was 16, and our overall rating was effective for um, MAPS based on last year's results. And, and highly effective starts at 18, right? 18 yes. to 20. Yes. So you're we were so, so close. <laughs> I've been chasing that 18 for two years. So hopefully next year will be the year, and I'll stand up here and say we are in the highly effective range, especially with our 5%. 
Um, so some continued improvement initiatives, what we're working on, um, as you've already heard, um, this year we've implemented kindergarten and first grade has a new phonics program, so we're anticipating that that's going to set children up for success in the area of ELA. Um, we have a good deal of professional development opportunities that are happening before and after school and on days like Dr. Rychek mentioned on election day. Um, some of them, just so that you're aware, our teachers are learning math professional developments. Um, our kindergarten, first grade, first and second grade teachers will be needing to collaborate on phonics. Um, there is data work that's going on with Jen Kreiserini and Kim Neisel in the area of math and ELA. Looking at our MAPS results, we take our MAPS three times a year and they're looking at the areas that students are doing well and the areas where they need support so that we can provide targeted instruction in those areas so that we can see growth. Um, teachers have asked to participate in book studies again this year so that they can sharpen their skills in ELA. Um, so all of that is going on in the building and it's been very much a team effort um, with the district administration and and teachers in the building all, you know, on board and working really, really hard. Um, we also have our regular data team meetings. We're looking at individual students and looking at what they need and what supports we can put in place for them so that they're successful. And our AIS providers are providing really targeted instruction to our kids who are most at risk or have been identified as the state is needing extra academic support. For our technology integration, um, most excitingly, I get to report um, we have Hour of Code coming up. Um, so our students will be participating in Hour of Code activities for a week in December. And most exciting is the students and parents will be coming to do that alongside each other on December 13th here at Violet Avenue before school. So they'll be coming in to do those activities together. Um, you'll see on one of my future slides, one of our, our goal this year for building leadership team is actually bringing families in and more learning opportunities with families alongside kids in the building. Um, so that very much supports not only the district school for technology, but also our goal to have families more involved in our school community. Um, we have regular um, professional development with our tech integrator and the technology department um, who's come in to, Therese has been wonderful about coming in and hosting Google and other learning opportunities for teachers before school. We continue to enjoy the interactive TVs that are part of our classroom instruction. Our Chromebooks, we have one for every grade level, so an entire class, um, more than 50% of our building could be on technology at one time. Um, we have enough for that and our wireless supports that. Um, and then our technology curriculum and that's going on in our library um, that's happening for all classes across the building. So I previewed our building leadership goals. Um, this year, um, our plan is to host more opportunities for families to spend time in the building and continue to partner with community resources to support our, our school community. Um, so some of the things that we've done to address this area so far, um, we've added a learning component to each PTA meeting. Um, so we started the school year with a review of our attendance and discipline policy to start the school year so parents could be familiar. Um, we also gave parents uh, during our second PTA meeting a tour of the website and where they could access information. So where they could tell what um, letter day it is of the cycle and when meetings are and when the board of ed meetings are. And we gave them a tour of the website. Um, and just this past Tuesday, we did a workshop. Our new school social worker, uh, Matteo Spitzer, did an overview of sort of bullying or if students are having an issue with each other and they want to report that or they want support for their students, how they can go about doing that and how they can talk to school administration and resources that are available to them in the building should their students be having any kind of issue in the building. Um, we've also been celebrating our students of the month at PTA meetings, which is nice because we've been able to get more parents in. I'm giving awards at the PTA meeting. So we've been getting parents in who may not necessarily attend um, and, and hoping that they might pique their interest and they might become more involved in the PTA or at least are hearing more about what's happening in the building. 
We are in the process of planning community care nights here at Violet Avenue. Um, that would be an opportunity. We're starting with once a month where resources would be available to families. Um, we that Those resources would include clothing, um, a, a food pantry is something that we're working on to provide that service for families who need. Um, learning opportunities and having people come in and present to families during that night. Um, the PTA meeting will be at the sa on the same evening so they can go up and join the PTA meeting. Um, and community resources, having them in so that they can share what they have to offer families in living in our community. And sort of a hospitality, just uh, an opportunity for them to come in and interact with teachers who are volunteering, myself, Milano, um, and just kind of come and spend some more time in the buildings. Um, so we anticipate that starting in December. We're waiting for some final approvals, but we're looking forward to those opportunities for family and for that growing over time. Pride, Milano, of course. <laughs> There are Milano cookies available on the tray back there, of course, <laughs> thanks to Mrs. Sanford. Um, we have our annual STEAM night. If you remember and you've been on the board for a couple of years, you'll remember that a couple of years ago our BLT goal was to enhance our science fair experiment and create a STEAM night. Um, that's now become an annual tradition. Mr. Heater has attended the last two and has even competed against the students. Um, we don't have this year's theme yet but it will be held on February 3rd at 6.30. Um, so if you're available and you would like to come, it is a great night um, and it's always fun. Last year we added a component where the parents competed against the kids. They had their own parents challenge. Um, so it is a lot of fun if you're available. We started off our school year with a mindfulness assembly. Um, some of our kids are participating in yoga instruction. Um, we will continue to have a volunteer thank you tea because we do um, benefit from many volunteers each week. Um, so we try to host that every year just to give back a little bit to everybody who's in our building, Mr. Heater being one, um, and giving back to our students each week. Um, we have had pizza dance night. We had our annual, Rachel mentioned our annual harvest night um, a couple of meetings ago that was very well attended and was a tremendous amount of fun. Um, our multi multicultural dance performance um, for second and third grade students will be in January. So I will be sure to send an invite out to that um, if you're available. Um, we have had a drumming residency and that will be starting up again in the spring um, and many other PTA events. The PTA does a really nice job about hosting opportunities for our families to come in. So our work with the community wouldn't be possible without a lot of the partners on this slide. Um, we continue to work very closely with Marist College um, and Bank Street's Prepared to Teach, um, having more teacher candidates in the building and learning alongside our teachers. Fairview Fire Department has been here for Halloween safety for our kindergarten students. Um, and very soon they'll be starting their annual fire safety lessons with all of the students in the building. Um, Town of Poughkeepsie Police has already helped us with several lockdowns and safety preparedness and done a safety review with our staff. Um, and they also provide their um, PBA provides food for families for Christmas. Um, so they usually provide 10 to 15 meals for families in the building. Church of the Messiah is a church in Rhinebeck that has a food pantry, a very active food pantry in the county, um, and they are who we have partnered with. They help us with our um, backpack snack program. They're helping us to apply and just received approval for the food pantry. Um, today, they delivered about 20 coats because we had some kids who were without coats with the cold weather change. Um, and they also provide school supplies um, every year for students who need it. So they are a tremendous source of support whenever we need them. Um, they're right there. Um, Food Bank of New York is now one of our partners because we're working on that project. Um, IBM's eWeek, which we enjoy each spring. And we continue to have, um, we have two right now, foster grandparents as part of the foster grandparent program in the county. And they volunteer in the classrooms and work um, side by side with teachers and kids throughout the day. 
And that is all of our community collaborations. Do you have any questions for me that I can answer? Um, yeah, I got one. Yeah. For the fifth grade, the, you know, for the um, math exam data. Yes. You, this fifth grade you scored um, really high compared to the district. Do you guys have any reason why you think that is? Um, or is it well, just a fluke of one time test? I, I, well, I think it is, it is fifth. No. Um, are you talking about math or ELA? Math. Math. Math exam. They also scored very high last year as well. Um, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. I think one of them is, is a culmination of really solid instruction. And by the time they're getting to fifth grade, that's building because they're coming from really strong instruction K4. Um, and the fifth grade teachers are also very hardworking. Um, the teachers here at Violet Avenue have really nice fidelity to the curriculum. Um, they're really following it. They teach it from day one. I know Dr. Rychek can speak personally. She, she loves to tell the story about a fifth grade classroom that she visited on the second day of school. Was it fractions or decimals? Decimals. decimals. Um, so it's down to business right away. No, no time lost. Um, so when we talk about our goal as far, I know, somewhere here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 when, when we talk about time on task and fidelity to curriculum, um, and that, you know, being part of our goal, that, that's something I don't worry about. Um, because they are working really, really hard, and they take it seriously, and they're on, and you know they want the best for the kids. So I think those three things are definitely a contributing factor to that higher score in math in fifth grade. Your opt-out rates seem extremely low. What's mm -hmm. your secret? <laughs> hmm. I don't. I don't know if we have a secret. Um, I think. We do communicate with families. We do we do send home a letter, you know, explaining what the state exams are, what they're used for. Um, the teachers do a really good job of, you know, encouraging all kids that, that they can do this, and there's no reason why they can't. And it's information, and it's a snapshot, and it's important to have. Um, other than that, um, I think we do a really good job, too, of just doing really solid instruction and not putting pressure on kids. Um, that they, you know, the, a lot of pressure around state testing or test prep or, you know, we, we try to make it a positive experience. We try to rally around the kids and tell them they're going to do great. Um, the teachers do a really good job of that, of cultivating that. and. We, we've enjoyed that low opt-out rate, and it seems to be decreasing um, as the years go on. So I hope that we'll continue to enjoy that this year as well. Seems to be working. Yeah, thank you. So I would just say, great job, great presentation. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you, um, Mr. Spence. As far as the spring assessments, um, yes. are we going to be doing um, computer-based testing or paper-based? It seems like the NWA has always run fine, but we're hoping the state can get their act together with their assessment. Yes. Um, for MAPS, we will continue. We will do a winter assessment because we found it very helpful to have a mid-year snapshot. So we have done the winter assessment every year, um, and that is computer-based. We will do the same in the spring to monitor their end of year progress, but our state exams will be paper based um, here at the elementary. Yeah. Thank you. A little more work administratively to kind of collate everything, get everything packaged just the way they like it. Um, but I, I do kind of still enjoy having my hands on, making sure that they're all there and everything's organized and that they get there safely. Um, yeah. So, what is the feedback from the PTA with the increase that you guys are looking to bring parents in? How is that working? So far, we have definitely had more families that have attended. Um, and one of the things that I noticed on Tuesday, which was a real change, um, was more of our parents are staying for the entire meeting, even after their students are receiving awards. Um, and this particular Tuesday, we had several Spanish-speaking parents. Um, our school social worker is bilingual. Well, actually, I think he's tri or quad 
bilingual. Um, but he does speak Spanish, um, so he was able to translate for our family. So, so we had several families that may not have stayed, um, but because he was there and he was able to translate, they were able to very comfortably um, ask questions, participate in, in the um, in, in the information that he was sharing and ask very specific questions very clearly and get their answers. Um, and he's very affluent, so it, it really worked nicely. Um, you know, both sides, both English speaking and Spanish speaking, were a part of the presentation, which was really nice. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Good job. Okay, on behalf of the board, we would like to thank the Violet Avenue teachers for coming to every board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is really special to have you guys there. And it actually makes it feel, an empty room just doesn't mean it's a board meeting, but having people there <laughs> makes a difference for, at least it does yes. for me, so I thank you. Yeah, thank you, it makes a difference for me too. Thank you, Deanna. Thanks. And Deanna, can you hand me the clicker? I will. I think I know, I'll, uh, they see me all the time. I'm gonna click from here. <laughs> Nice job, Deanna. Thank you very much. So next is um, Raise the Age. Raise the Age, yes. So uh, the High Park Central School District is in a very unique um, spot in the state while we're not entirely alone because there are two other school districts that um, are impacted by the Raise the Age law. Um, there, there are only three, and you'll see in the presentation the other school districts, uh, the, the number that they could potentially have is much smaller. So I'm gonna start uh, by saying that um, the Raise the Age Law, New York State was one of the, one of the latter states to join this initiative. And this is an opportunity where a student who is 16 years old uh, instead of going into incarceration, actually goes to an alternative setting um, and uh, can, can reside at a facility that is considered an 853 facility, a residential facility. Uh, in a previous job, I did oversee preschool, we used to say preschool to prison, um, in the Kingston City School District, uh, we covered preschool all the way to incarcerated youth. And as the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, the incarcerated youth came under my jurisdiction. We actually hired the guidance counselors, hired the teachers, and I did several observations over at um, the county jail, I guess it was. So um, I am a proponent for finding an alternate um, venue for students who are 16 other than being incarcerated. And the data that exists in the, throughout our nation is that the rate, rate of recidivism under Raise the Age programs improves. So um, with that said, you know, there's some unique uh, situations here in New York State for Hyde Park. So the first bulk of the slides were given by these people right up here from the Office of Family and Children's Services. This was a presentation given in April of 2018. Um, it is, uh, a f raise the age is a function of uh, the Office of Family and Children's Services, and so they are the ones who disseminate all the information. Oops, I'm going backwards. So the goal is to provide more rehabilitative services for younger um, offenders, uh, as I just mentioned, reduce the recidivism rate, and protect teams from the traumatic situation of actually being in an adult prison. Um, generally, again, they're not in the section of the prison for adults. They're were contained in a section that was for 16 to 18 year olds, it does not diminish the prison setting. I don't know why I get this backwards, the clicker thing. Um, 
So uh, the current service trends is that over 80% of the juvenile delinquents are initially admitted to a voluntary agency. Um, and uh, the voluntary agency for us is the children's home. Um, and youth admitted to the voluntary agency have longer uh, residential stays than youth uh, starting in an OCFS facility. So for us, the OCF facility closest to us is over in New Paltz. Um, and again, they are say, reporting that students who go to a voluntary agency uh, fare a little bit better. If you're familiar at all with you know, the facility in, in New Paltz, it's not a prison, but it resembles more of a prison than um, an 853 facility like the children's home. Um, and uh, again, this is their report that effective VA programming is voluntary agency programming uh, is crucial to raise the age success. Um, and adding aftercare should improve youth outcomes. Um, the raise the age puts the children who go to a volunteer agency, such as the children's home, in that placement for eight months. Again, a little bit problematic for a public school because now we're getting kids on our rosters and our cohorts. They're only gonna be here for eight months if all the paperwork isn't done um, which is a big problem with uh, getting the paperwork, the students then wind up staying on our cohort, and if they're seniors and still on our cohort, could have a very negative impact on our graduation rate. So, not that I don't, but I'm gonna qualify this. I think raise the age is a good thing. I think it's, there's some things that are unique to our experience in Hyde Park. Let's see if I get it right that time, I did. Um, so the guiding principles uh, serve youth with complex needs and behaviors, mental health, sexual exploitation, aggression. I'm not going to read uh, the slides. I'll let you read them. Um, so all of that applies to the voluntary agency. So when you see things such as effective security features, modern infrastructure, uh, you know, that, that, that's what happened. That's for the children's home. That has nothing to do with a public school setting. But um, uh, they have school day workers, uh, direct care staff to accompany children to school. I'm going to talk about this later because that is not part of the experience here. Maybe it could be. Um, it's the design of the program, but again, we're in a unique situation. Um, and the cost is um, presumed under the Raise the Care a, a raise the age care and maintenance rate. So again, these are all still slides from the OCFS. This was a presentation given to all of the voluntary agencies um, that attended that workshop. And the educational programs, um, they say deeply engaged with the New York State Education Department and the key word there is engaged. Um, there is no direct, um, did I skip a slide? All right. This one? No. One more? Back one. Back one. That one. That one. This yeah. one. That one. Okay. So the educational program. The reason why this slide reads this way is, and I'll just state this now, so there are 13 voluntary agencies in New York State. Um, 10 of them have their own school on property. So the whole design of Raise the Age was that the voluntary agency would be a, an 853 agency that had a school on site. Um, three agencies without and on-campus school were awarded the funding. 
and the Children's Home was one of the agencies that was awarded the funding. So when they talk about the educational program on this slide, um, this is what we do for all children, obviously. Um, this slide is designed to say that um, the places that had a, a school on site would have to meet all those criteria if they didn't have it on place already, in place already. But as, as you know, this, we don't have a program that doesn't meet any of those things. Um, so deeply engaged, again, there's no regulations in state ed uh, law that govern a raise the age child in a public setting. So, but they're deeply engaged. Um, there was an upcoming learning collaborative with school partners on, uh, from state ed. It was one day. Um, we were not um, at that part, at that point, um, a partner, um, so we didn't go to the one day thing. And then relationships with local colleges, BOCES local districts. So the status in Hyde Park is a little bit tricky because, um, again, the program was designed for facilities that had an on-campus school where the children could be educated and receive the therapeutic services that they um, require. Um, with that said, the uh, Raise the Age application for the children's home was approved and um, because they don't have a campus school, um, the public school uh, becomes the designated school. In the um, in the passing of the Raise the Age legislation, the children don't become incarcerated, they become foster children and um, are placed in 853 facilities. So 10 of the agencies have their own program. The three agencies rely on educational programs within the public school setting. Uh, I'm in contact with the Jefferson County, um, the Watertown School District that's in Jefferson County. Um, she's been very uh, accessible. She shared the grant um, that their uh, children's home of Jefferson County, um, they have uh, been allotted, they applied for and were allotted four male beds, four female beds. They really, they only have one student or at least as of a month ago, one student in the program. Timothy Hall is out on Long Island and they have uh, applied <laughs> for and received 60 male beds. The children's home of Poughkeepsie, 20 male beds. Six, 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 what did I say, six. 60? Yeah. Oh, six. It's good. Th <coughs> hey, people are listening. <laughs> <laughs> good. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, right now, um, the children's home, the last bullet there, currently there are three raise the age students uh, at the children's home. Um, We did not, um, there's supposed to be a collaboration and a joint application um, with the school district and the 853 institution if you wanted to apply for Raise the Age. Um, we did not uh, jointly fill out an application. Um, the Children's Home did and they were awarded um, the grant. Um, we did bring it to the attention of State Education Department and OCFS that while we were named in the application, um, we, there was no collaboration or partnership, um, but we learned that uh, they received the grant regardless of 
the educational programming aspect. Um, the Children's Home of Poughkeepsie received somewhere between 1.7 and 2.2 million dollars. Um, the, the zero funding comes to the school district. Um, I did, uh, and again, this is not for lack of support of the Raise the Age program. Um, I did not, we did not feel we were equipped. We did not feel we were ready. We did not feel that uh, we understood the program um, and were, were prepared to um, support the students who may enter our doors um, because we felt that they needed a lot of support all of the funding, most of that 1.7 million um, that the Children's Home receives is in staff. None of that staff was designated to come to our school. Um, so we had a lot of questions um, and a lot of concerns. And, um, but lo and behold, um, the grant was awarded. Uh, we have quite a, uh, document trail between the school district, OCFS, and state education, um, raising our concerns about the application and our involvement. And again, I, I want to reiterate over and over again that I think Raise the Age is a good program for 853 schools, especially if they have the school on campus where all the staff that they get the funding for is there. So. Uh, the long and short of it was we got a visit from the Commissioner of Education last year. Doug was with me, um, and it was a very interesting meeting. And at that meeting, she said that what she would like to do is change the law so that the students could go to the alternative program at BOCES, but she couldn't change the law. Um, and the design for the few public schools, the three public schools affected in New York is that the school district still had to uh, register the children and then um, put them into a program. Um, whether they go into our high school or the alternative program, but we were told and um, very directly that we could send the Raise the Age students to the Do Duchess Alternative Program. We had a meeting with uh, the Children's Home earlier this year um, to review our expectations, talk about process. Um, so our understanding still is that when we receive a registration from the Raise the Age child, we can initiate the um, application for them to go to the Duchess Alternative Program. Um, there are currently three students at the Children's Home right now, um, and uh, I'm just reading where they are. Um, one is one is at at Duchess, and two were placed at other facilities um, based on their needs. Um, so we'll continue to um, navigate this. Uh, our plan is to send them to the alternative program. Richard Hooley, uh, Dr. Hooley, was also at the meeting with the Children's Home. Um, and a, a big part of the conversation was if the program application indicated that there would be on-site staffing in the school setting, we need to find out what that looks like. They need to identify who those people will be, what their function will be, and, and how they will integrate um, at Duchess BOCES. So I don't know if I have another slide here. That's, that's it? Okay, so um, the tricky part is that, um, well, the commissioner's gone. 
<laughs> and uh, we're going to follow the protocol that as the students arrive, we will put them in the alternative placement. Some of them come in with an IEP, and the IEP indicates that they need to be in, 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 a, in a different uh, setting, and that's a whole different ball of wax because they have a CSE meaning. So our plan is to follow this protocol. Um, and so um, for the district, then we still have to run the CSE e meetings, the yes. IEP, as the school of record? We actually have to um, accept the students as our own, as foster children, so that even if they go to the BOCES program or any other program, they are registered as our students, and they count in our cohorts for graduation. And all of the paperwork, all the administrative work, all of the CSE is all done at the public setting, at the public school setting. So um, zero funding um, and uh, we do have administrative work that we take on for any foster child in the children's home and now these are part of the foster children that come through. So um, we, they, there is a reimbursement if the student's residence is not Hyde Park, then um, there's a reimbursement for the BOCES program. So as also for our percentages, we pay to BOCES, these numbers will add into that percentage? Yes. Um, again, if they're not currently residing within our school district, we do get um, some reimbursement. It's not all, but it's most of the reimbursement. Can I can I talk to that? Sure. Yeah. So for students that don't live in our district, we can bill their district of origin, but we can only bill them the approved rate by New York State. They set the uh, the tuition rates every year. So we can get reimbursed from the home school district for the amount of the approved rate, and we would have to uh, subtract off the bill any aid that we get um, you know, for any of the public access cost aid we might get for the students that are at BOCES. So for our BOCES rate, are we below that or above that? Uh, some, it depends on the services the students are getting. Um, if it's just the uh, tuition, I believe that we're getting the full amount back after we take off our aid. So I also want to say that we have a long history of a great relationship with the children's home and their foster care system. I will also say that this was a shift um, and that in order to accommodate the 20 beds for Raise the Age, their other foster program went away and this came in. So it's a definite change um, and we would have preferred to have more time to um, figure this out. Um. So from a funding perspective, if, if they had a school on site, would that 1.7 to 2.2 be the same? Or if you have a school on site, is, is, do they get a lot more money? I'm not sure. Each part of the grant weighed a certain amount, so I haven't seen the formula as to how the application was weighed financially. Um, I, I certainly have a copy of the Children's Home application and where all the funding is going to, but I don't know how they assign the numeric value to each of the components of the grant. I mean, I guess the numeric value is whether or not they get it or not. But I mean, it would be I interesting to see if there was a similar, a comparable 20-bed solution with a school to see how much money they got. And yeah. then the delta really would be what should be coming to us, right? Right. Since we're providing the education. Right. Well, minimally, um, the, the minimally, if you just looked at it from the aspect of how many counselors and social workers and all, all that support staff that's written into the children's home grant, 
for the hours of the school day, that staff is supposed to be with the children in the school setting. So right now, there technically should be a system in place where a percentage of that personnel is on site at BOCES. Because the kids, the kids aren't there during the day. They're, they're in a school setting. So that's, that's what we were really struggling with was the design of the system wasn't as, it, there's a big flaw there. So unless you're, you set it up so that you knew, okay, so we're going to get these children and here's the support network for them. Um, but that, that's not the case. There's, right now that, entire staff and that entire funding is at the children's home and nowhere else where those children are that are coming in hmm. so any other questions can I ask a question yes. no, public, public participation okay, <laughs> Okay, at this time, can I have a motion for public participation? <laughs> State your name. Now, come on up. Second? I just, hi. Wait, wait, wait. We have to vote. <laughs> was there a second? Ed? Ed was second. Okay. All those in favor? Motion carries. Now, if you'd like to address the board, please come and state your name. Don't be um, shy. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I'm Jen Chemnitzer. I'm one of the school psychologists at Haviland. I just had a question in reference to the alternative program you're talking about at BOCES. So if a student doesn't have an IEP, they are still eligible for that program? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, the alternative high school has both classified and non-classified okay. students. Thank you. All right. Good. Would anybody else like to address the board? Good evening, Steve Hughes, District Resident. First, the angry rhetorical question. Given that the polls are open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., <laughs> and that there's early voting, and voting takes significantly less than an hour, not three hours, and that voting and casting a ballot is a democratic right that people should be expected to exert some personal effort, if necessary, to, to, to perform. Whose bright idea was it to give employees three hours off in order to vote? Hmm. Yeah. Now, a couple of real questions. With the early voting, does that mean an employee can take three hours off any time during the early voting, or is it only on election day? And secondly, could the school district have no school on election day, still maintain, and I know it's by hours now, but um, on the old school, still maintain the 185, 180 days? Could they do that um, and thus not affect the, the students in any, any way? Thank you. Would anybody else like to come and address the board? Hi, Bobby Goodman. I just have a question about, like, we know the commissioner is now changed, and she said it was okay for these students to go to the alternative program, but the new one could come in and we could potentially have 20 students in our high school if they don't allow them to go there, and I just want to make sure I understand it, without the support staff that they are getting paid for. That's my question. Anybody else would like to come and address the board? Seeing no one, um, public participation is now closed. Um, so Steve, I do believe the law was meant for those commuting to New York City to allow them time to come home to vote, that if they had to. Um, but I think it went to the extreme of saying you don't have three hours, but they should change the law, I do agree. Yeah, um, one of the things that we learned afterwards, uh, and Linda went to a workshop too, um, there wasn't a lot of information out, just that we had to post the law in a prominent place, that um, people had to notify the school district 
48 hours in advance and that we could determine whether it was the beginning of the day or the end of the day. The nuance that we learned afterwards was that it's up to three hours. It's not an automatic three hours. So um, some districts had a form that the employee would fill out and say, you know, what's your address? What's your voting place? And they could say, well, you can have an extra 20 minutes or um, whatever, but um, that might not be very practicable from a management point of view for 100 plus employees. But um, so, so that's one piece of it. One is that um, we don't, it's up to three hours. So everybody that accessed this um, on November 5th took the full three hours, even if they were a resident of Hyde Park voting in Hyde Park. Um, uh, so, um, and that, w I have to say that wasn't what the rest of the county experienced, so we were unique in that. Um, we could close on November 5th and still make the 180 days, just have no professional development that day and no students that day on an election day. But then we have to look at taking it from someplace else. Spring break, winter break, Wednesday before Thanksgiving. It, it has to come from someplace else in the calendar. And knowing that we could face it again, we have to consider that a viable option. Um, I know that there's a lot of pressure in the state right now to change the law because people felt that it was so flawed because it didn't, it put people in a really hard position. Um, I would be breaking the law if I said to somebody they couldn't have time off for voting, but um, <coughs> do they really need time off when the polls are open from six to nine? You know, I don't, I don't know. You know, it's not up to me. It became a law, so it wasn't my, you know, so there's a lot of pressure to change it. Um, and I know that the state is looking at um, all of the numbers that came in for the people that accessed early voting. And they're kind of saying, well, if we had early voting, why did we say time off as well? Or, you know, I don't, I don't think they anticipated a lot of the potential consequences. Um, I don't know what would have happened if, if we had children here that day. I'd like to think that people would have stayed, but I don't know, you know, it's a law. <laughs> so but we're, we're gonna take a look at it from a calendar perspective, and uh, unless the law changes, we have to accommodate the potential of a reoccurrence for a June date. The next date is on a Regents Day um, and a school day for children. So I don't know what we're going to do with that one. So. So could we add a, an extra day for the school year and have that a holiday? Well, we would either need to have an extra day somewhere or take away uh, a, a no, vacation. I don't want to take day. anything away, but why don't we just make it a holiday and add one extra day to the, the school year and then close the school on election day. The same number of days, everybody's going to work the same number of days. Oh, next year. <clears throat> a limited number of days to work with. Right. You've got regions at the end of the year and... Uh, right, so there are primaries this June during Regents Week. Yeah. Ne and next year we can address with calendar, but that primary is still coming. And obviously, we need to give the exam. So this is in effect for primaries as well as general. Elections. Yes. Yes. Yeah, for everything. Yeah. Is it also? For it's not for school board elections, though. So. No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> They're not important. Yeah. No. Um. Um, so to Bobby's question with the commissioner gone, um, that's a very interesting. One, because if you go back to that keyword, is that OCFS is engaged with SED. There is no regulation to accommodate this. Um, certainly, um, we could make it a practice to continue to do this, which is our plan. Um, could it be challenged? It could possibly be challenged. Um, uh, we don't anticipate, I don't think the Children's Home anticipates having all 
20 beds full, but that could happen. That's why they were awarded that many. It is an eight month program and that eight months could start at any time. So the children could, you know, it's, it's not these eight months, it's any eight months. So the students could be here for part of a year or part of that year or so, yeah. So there's no roadmap, um, but we plan to continue to uh, do as we were, um, informed that we were able to do. Um, there's nothing to say that it's wrong, but there's nothing to say that that's the roadmap either. An answer to the question about even if they did not need any services for raise the age, they would go to POSIs? Remind me, even if they don't oh, need services? The question was, um, th yeah, um, Oh, a, a lot the of alternative high school. Yeah, the alternative high school is at beta where the adolescent day treatment program is, but they're separate programs. So if you're a student with an IEP, you can go to either program, whichever is appropriate. If you're a student without an IEP, you can only go to the alternative high school because it is integrated. And we have sent non-classified students there in the past few years um, that were not in the Raise the Age program. So it's, it's a program we do utilize for non-classified students. So how do we... How do we keep track of that? Because a lot of our BOCES program, so. So between Rick Party and I. So I, I approve any of those um, referrals that are made and keep track. It's not a lot of students to keep track of. Yeah. <laughs> well, right, it's like eight. Oh, but it's only students three and raise the age. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay, any other? Okay, on the board discussion, um, let's go back to the retreat date. Was that January 30th or February 6th? I prefer the January 30th. February 6th would be a Dutchess County School Board Association <laughs> meeting. I agree. I prefer the 30th of January. Thank you for your support. You're welcome. <laughs> now, what time would we start? Well, and that, that's another question. We could start a little earlier. We could start at 6 o'clock. Uh, so everybody prefers the January one? Is that what I heard? Not really, but <laughs> okay, we vote, we I just two. have to know how much time I have to get off work. That's all. Well, the February one's the same night as at Northport STEM Fair. So it's kind of a conflict, but... So, what do you guys say for January 30th? I'm good with any I, time. I, I can make it. Mm -hmm. Ed's fine? Denise? Yeah. Oh, yes. And Carl? I think I'm good. I'll like check the, the calendar at home. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, we'll set for January 30th. I do believe we should be getting, uh, do we have some guys together to work on this? Well, we said it should be the three board members who are on the strategic planning. Yes. Planning. Yeah. yeah, that's it. So we need to get together. So I'll reach out to you guys. <laughs> okay. Um, subcommittee reports. Any subcommittee reports? No. No. No committee meetings. All right. We haven't met. Okay, no committee reports. Uh, let's move on to consent agenda. Can I have a motion for the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Oh. The motion carries. Oh, I'm sorry. Say it, I'll do it some other time. Never mind. Okay, um, uh, on to new business. Can I have a motion for 11.1, .1, special education placements? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Can I have a motion for 11.2, the HPTA Memorandum of Understanding, the wrestling coach stipend? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Can I have a motion for 11.3, first consideration of policies? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Got a motion for 11.4, overnight field trip, baseball, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. So moved. Second. Any discussion? 
All those in favor? Motion carries. I have a motion for 11.5, overnight field trip, Rochester, Nisma. No more. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Going too fast. <laughs> um, I think Mike, yeah. Sure. Ready to go on? Got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, motion for 11.6, memorandum of agreement for said car. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. We have a motion for 11.7, North Park Elementary Capital Project, change order number one, water systems. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Can I have a motion for second public participation? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? We're now in second participation. If anybody else would like to address the board, please come to the microphone and state your name. Seeing none, public participation is now closed. There is no other matters deemed necessary by the board. No need except for a second. I, except maybe, I didn't talk, I didn't, was I supposed to talk at the committee stuff? Yes. Well, I always get confused about when you want me to speak up. <laughs> Can I just go quick yes, go over? I go. Make it quick. I will make it quick. <laughs> I'm already shutting down. Oh. <laughs> I just wanted to. I've got two pages of notes, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to read them. All. <laughs> I just wanted. To, I just wanted to tell everybody that um, I want to thank you all for for sending me. Stop it. I wanted to thank everybody for sending me to the NISBA convention. It was really, really wonderful. The highlight I just wanted to talk about was during the expos. Um, they not only have vendors there, but they have student groups that come from different students, from different schools, and they were fabulous. And they had a, a science club. I don't know, what, I remember what they called themselves, but they made robots and they competed and it was really intense. And they had to have a, a book with governance and plans and fundraising goals and on everything they had to do. And there were a couple of districts that participated in that. And that was unbelievably impressive. Um, I got to hear the. I got to hear that our safety um, committee does an outstanding job because I I went to a session where um, it was Saratoga schools were talking about all the things they were doing to beef up their safety initiatives and we were way ahead of them so I just felt really good about that that made me feel really good um, and. I talked to other board members, of course. But the really cool thing was that I got to listen to Shannon Lanier. He's the sixth great grandson of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemming. And he um, spoke about just all kinds of things, but mostly about how schools, the, the, the theme was the importance of schools to better know their students and where they come from in their heritage, culture, and personal situation. And it was really inspiring. So there's a lot more. If anybody would like to hear more, I'd be so happy to talk to them about it. But thank you for letting me go. Now I'm done. We Any comments? <laughs> okay. <laughs> there is no need for a second executive session. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So move. Wait. Second. There was three people moving it. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Whatever. We're now adjourned. I was, I was